Okay, so, hello, <laughs> I made it, um, so I, I think we've got half an hour, is that, is that yes. right, so, can I stretch that how I want, in regards you to questions? You can stretch it how you want, Great. Yes, okay. but it, it can't extend it. Okay, <laughs> so um, for those that don't know me, my name's Chris Follows, I've uh, been a school fellow since last year, June, July-ish. Um, and I've been, my host institution is University of the Arts London. So I've mainly been looking at the sector within art, design and media. I'm just going to navigate to my post. I've tried to do everything online to be a, to be a good. Uh, I've got no paper, so I'm totally eco-friendly. <laughs> and you can all follow along, because it's all online. So if you, uh, if you want to navigate to Process Arts, which is, uh, if you Google Process Arts, it's process.arts.ac.uk. <coughs> and you'll come to a front page like this. You can click on uh, Project Groups, see all groups here, or go to the drop-down menu here, which says Project Groups, and there's a score group. Click on the score group. And that, that's the main core of resources that I'm going to be talking about. Although I'm also going to be talking about process arts. As well. <coughs> I'll just go up to my presentation. <coughs> the joys of online uh, presentations. So. Um, Hopefully you've all got it on your screen, because obviously this is uh, not, not that clear. Uh, apologies for that. So uh, my title was Exploring Collaboration, uh, Collaborative Use and Reuse of uh, OER Rich Media Resources in Art and Design. Now, uh, that's in, in the score. If you go to the score, then, then there's a post on the, fr on the front of that page called Score, just Score. So it's about fourth down. So uh, part of my fellowship obviously was working at the University of Arts London and there's lots of projects going on there because we were already engaged in a, in a UK OER phase two at that, at that point. So I was involved in that as well. So I had quite a good perspective from both SCORE and the UK OER scene, which I, I, I found really valuable. Uh, also, subsequently, we've been involved in uh, the Digital Literacies Programme, and I'm currently the project manager of that uh, programme. So, obviously, the complementary um, aspects of being a school fellow and involved in UK OER and DIO and Digital Literacies it was, was uh, really, really good. Also, we've just recently received the PG CERT OER uh, funding, so we're producing a module, uh, a unit of uh, open educational practice. I will talk more about that towards the end. So the project aims were to support and encourage the use and reuse of OER practices and rich media content, investigate and evaluate the most effective and efficient ways of utilising OER in art and designs, HEIs, and identify the best processes and practices. And I think that was one of the important elements that came out of the actual fellowship for creating learning resources and objects to support the learning and teaching. So I, I, I think um, the processes and practices, that's where the emphasis of the fellowship went on to more than objects, OER objects. Uh, observe and contrast current practice in, in uh, OER community, which I did a lot of, and I'm sure we all have, a lot of talking, a lot of um, meeting people. Examine the effectiveness of inter-college and HEI collaborations. Now that was really important. Uh, but also a big, a big ask, and and I, I was pleased with the amount of uh, all the amount that we've I'm currently have of engagement with other colleges uh, over the se across the sector, and I'll talk about how that happened. And the the biggie, which was again, this was uh, I wrote this last year, was to develop an arts UK OER remix and redistribute community of practice. Again, when I wrote that, I thought, there's, how am I going to do that? 
So what did I do? So <clears throat> I went through uh, a few different phases, basically. I think there's about four phases, and the first was just a sort of bedding in, getting an overview of the current landscape. Content groups and communities. So I, after uh, observing the landscape, I moved into the uh, to, to looking at uh, creating OER or open practice communities uh, based around content. That then led to defining open educational practice, so moving away from OER, and I'm now in a sort of phase of sustainable future and open educational environments, and basically how to go forward uh, after the school fellowship. So I, 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 I had a, a cycle of observation, communication, participation, action, and reflection, and I kept doing this cycle. And this was quite a nice cycle to apply also to open educational practice, uh, the idea that, um, that your, your first way into open educational practice is to be an ob observer of, of other people practicing. So uh, I've got uh, three aims, three or four aims. I'll start with the first one, which was to gain an insight and an overview of the current landscape. So to do that, I took part in a lot of um, activities with SCORE, but also took part in a lot of activities at the university. And we have uh, like learning studio events where we all go into a room, staff, and we all talk to each other about what we're doing. So I presented every single one of that each month uh, as a SCORE fellow. So that, that was really useful in regards to um, meeting people across the institution. Also did a, a series of surveys. Now the sur the advantage of working both with Alto UK and um, with the UK OER and the digital literacies is that we could all bring the surveys together in regards to what I wanted to do for SCORE as well. Um, and that's actually it was a good case in point in regards to that people are surveyed out. And so what that actually, best practice wise, what that actually, uh, what we developed was a sort of generic survey. And you'll see at the bottom of this uh, process arts there's a survey link, and that's the the sort of generic uh, all uh, for everyone to use survey. So uh, the whole university is using that. People use it on their courses for surveying. So if they want to do a survey of their class, they can put a, a sort of metadata a hashtag of their class, and we can pull that data out. So they don't have to recreate new surveys. And that's currently got around 150 staff responses, which is fantastic. And we're actually just processing that data at the moment, but we've already got an insight into that data. Uh, there's lots of information that people have actually typed in, so it's not just all click uh, data. And there's, there's some quite interesting stuff coming out of that. One of the key things, or one of the key findings of that, that, that I, I can see is that the... Uh, the use of social media is is just going sky high, and for me, that's one of the big things that I've identified as a, as a potential future thing to uh, problem to area to address. So we also did staff uh, surveys for students, and that was fantastic. We had uh, students talking to students, and I, I talked with students as well, and did a, a few workshops, and. That again, the, there's because I was looking at OERs and reuse of OERs. I think to get to that point, you have to understand practice and open educational practice, and that's basically what I discovered during this evaluation stage of what I wanted to do. And the students were basically so, so when they said, well, "Would you contribute to OER?" Um, they really need to know what OER is and what open practice is. Even if you explain what OER is, they still maybe need to then start practicing and get into environments that uh, to practice. <coughs> so the process of encouraging practicing OER reuse within the art sector was a challenge because of the lack of uh, the quantity of resources and variety. And again, this is this has come out of lots of other people's research within the arts as well. Uh, both the HEA Centre at Brighton, uh, sorry, the, um, the um, 
subject centre at Brighton and Kingston University have all done uh, research and they've all come back with the same findings. There's not a lot of art stuff out there. And the stuff that is out there is uh, made up of research papers, lectures, images, lots of images, um, panel discussions, technical instructional stuff, uh, lots of digital instructional videos, uh, and lots of research papers, that sort of thing. Um, what's missing is the difficult stuff. So the um, tacit, hard to codify information, the practice-based stuff that goes on day to day in the studios. So if I scroll down a little bit here, this next one, there's a lovely green image there. Now here I've, I've sort of started to think about, this is sort of moving into the next phase start to think about uh, the institution and the individual and how we're dealing with OER and creating OER and, being, and practicing in that, in that space. So if you look at it as how OER and open practice uh, are encouraged or developed in institutions or personally, you've got your funded options, which is where the UK OER programme that we've been doing in the digital literacies and our research online repository is was funded also by obviously JISC. So I've, I've sort of classed that within a non-organic, um, quick, quick fix sort of project um, solution to OER and open practice. And I'm, I'm going down this organic road because obviously the, there was a recent article in the in the paper about um, bringing GM crops in and. Uh, what that would mean for agriculture. So if we think of OER as, uh, the funded OER as, as not quite organic, it's got use of pesticides <laughs> as well. And then we've got the GM, the genetically modified, commercially viable OER uh, under commercial control. Um, and that's where we're going. That's where uni uh, universities are going. All their content is going into these commercial third party um, as primary places. Now, what we're not doing as institutions is, is saying, what happens in five years' time when I want to come out of that? Is you're not going to be able to come out of that because you're so embedded in, the, in these third party commercial um, environments that it, it's, 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 you, you, you're sort of out of it. Um, the problem for me for that space, I love these channels. I love iTunes U. I love uh, uh, YouTube and Facebook. I use that. But I use those as secondary channels. And uh, they're great channels, you know, 200,000 hits on our Process Arts YouTube channel. Um, but I think the main thing is they're secondary. So the organic OER is the homemade, in house, uh, grassroots, bottom up innovation. Uh, that comes from universities and that's what you need to keep and that's what you need to nurture and that's what you uh, need to to grow because if you've got your own almost edu social environment within your sector um, you're, you're free from ads you've got a bit more control on it and um, you've hopefully got a, a more sustainable future. So it's a bit of the chicken and egg, really. I've got a chicken there, I think. Yeah, there's a chicken. A bit of a chicken and egg thing in regards to, again, the OER and open educational practice. So I sort of uh, moved away from the, the notion of OER and almost dropped that term totally and went into open educational practice and that's been my focus ever since. So to do open educational practice uh, I looked at communities of practice and people supporting each other and helping each other. To do that I would need some a platform to do it. Now I could go onto Facebook, I could go onto all this, but obviously that would be going against what I, my, my findings. So I went with uh, an existing, I actually tried other, other areas as well, and I tried the CloudWorks and I tried 
open learn and it wasn't for me and I think that's what's important that people just find a place for them you'll find a place to practice online and the place that I went to was Process Arts which was a site I started again with no, no funding just through a 30 day fellowship and um, it's had no institutional support whatsoever uh, other than uh, fellowships and and um, a little bit of um, development. So I, I, I use this for my score fellowship basically for the whole year and for those that were at the Cambridge you could see the, there was an impact chart of when I started using process arts to develop communities uh, the um, statistics of Google were, were, were really going up in regards to participation and, and people joining. Now everyone says uh, you can't take uh, the amount of hits on a site as any sort of uh, useful data. I'd, I'd question that and say actually you can because again one of the key elements of open educational practice is observation. Now all the feedback we've had from people that are using process arts is the, the, what the reason they, they, they like it or use it or what they use it for is to observe, is to see what's going on. So again that's important. So again, the, 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 so the process art site, I, I called it, a, well, I, I sort of thought of it as a research vessel, almost. And um, what I was, I've always had in mind this iceberg um, from the Oxford study and of the, all this sort of on below the surface social media OER stuff going on that no one really knows, but it does, but everyone no one really acknowledges and then you've got the little tip of the iceberg at the top where everyone's um, where that's uh, sort of safe OER people are doing correct practice in a way I wanted to create a vessel that broke that iceberg and I, I kind of see that this model of this sort of education social in-house uh, development as, as, as bridging that gap basically so that means to support grassroots innovation, and I think that's already been said today, and it seems to be coming up quite a lot about bottom-up. Um, and what we did here was uh, communities of interest. So um, that was quite important. So rather than focusing on courses, on institutions even, because there's no real institution uh, uh, as such represented here, and not even University Arts London, it's quite important to focus on the interests and um, that's what the groups were doing. They were, they were pulling people together that were all had a common interest to um, find out more about something. And again, that seems to be where we're going. And it's quite interesting that the Pinterest thing uh, came up at Cambridge as well, which I found out about. So it's a sort of uh, going down a similar road to that. Really. And the other important thing is agile development. So. Process Arts has is, is been totally, as it's been developed, has been an agile project in regards to it's responded. When people come online and they do something and they comment, we can instantly respond to resolve or to make better their experience of, of practicing online. So it's, 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 it's being created uh, basically almost day to day, which is a, a bit scary and it's a bit, um, it's not very professional because things change and, and, and it's, 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 it's not the best practice but it works and it's uh, proven quite useful. So with the arts institution and looking and working with artists and designers there's the, the, the notion of appropriation is, is obviously quite um, embedded in practice anyway from the start. Um, it's, it's basically something you question from the beginning of, of your practice. So again, I think there's a, there's, there's a huge area there for exploring, which I've been exploring, about um, how artists appropriate content and deal with copyright and deal with IPR and all that sort of stuff. So there's a, lots of really interesting things bubbling away at the moment in that area. And so, so the idea of ownership and a, a new thing that's sort of starting to come up is ego which I think is quite interesting, so I've got an ego ER. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so, so there's this, there's this 
again, it's almost like to encourage people to go online, you've, you've got to make that step and sort of drop that baggage behind. And so I think comments that, that basically make pe put people off a sense. I think there's got to be as much encouragement within these communities, communities just to just to go for it. Uh, ego we are or not, you just go for it. <clears throat> okay, IPR. There was a. I've had no IPR issues whatsoever on Process Art since I've been uh, working with this site. Part one, which was. A resource that I took from our university repository system, which was a research repository. I took that resource and put it into here under the correct license that it was on, and it was on the site for over a year. Loads of hits, loads of hits, loads of comments. It was amazing comments. Um, I contacted the author to say, "Your resource is going down really well here, and uh, well done." And uh, he wrote back basically saying, take it offline now, it's published, I'm going to get my um, publishers to sue you. So, okay. <laughs> but it's on, uh, it's been on Joram for two years, <laughs> <laughs> and it's been in our repository system for three years. It was done during a fellowship at the university, uh, which was paid obviously by the university. Uh, it was released as OER originally, I think. Um, and then obviously something's changed and, and we've decided to publish it. Okay? So, uh, something like 49 quid for a little handbook. So, uh, obviously, pulled it off, and um, but he was very angry, and, and it was very stressful. And I think this is a part of the practice that, again, that's that's quite, that you need to understand and know about. That experience was really stressful, and so anyone that goes through that experience needs maybe to be supported in that. And luckily, I had the support of my Centre for Learning and Teaching Art and Design. So, moving forward, um, looking at sustainable environments, again, there's some statistics on here in regards to how many people are actually using this site, and uh, there are uh, something like and remember this is a non-funded site nearly 500 logged in users, um, over nearly one and a half thousand pieces of OER content. Um, that there are posts or videos, all downloadable. Again, th there's this idea that when you're looking for OER, uh, it says it's OER, but it's a Vimeo, and it can't be downloaded, or it's a YouTube that's not got the remix tab on it. And so I think it's important, and that's what we try to do on here, is to ensure that you can download the video, that you can download this content and, and it's licensed. It's all got licenses, uh, Creative Commons license option to choose. Okay, so the future. Um, obviously, I was looking at the, the, the this was built in Drupal. Um, it meant that I, we, we could um, have a, a student developer involved who, who didn't want that much money, who was... He wanted more money, but um, he was he was happy to work for for uh, not a great amount of money. Um, so that fit within our sustainability plan uh, to develop. And um, we had another developer who was involved in the project uh, for, from interest version. Um, so, so in that sense, Drupal was a great model for developing a platform. Um, uh, we've built two repositories at the university. One is our research online, and one is the Alto project, which is a file store, and that was all built in EdShare. And uh, it was a very expensive uh, experience. It's difficult to adapt. Uh, what happens when the money goes? What happens when you want to make changes? So uh, I looked at different platforms, and, and basically if you were to compare the two, um, you would say, well, what can one do that the other can't? and uh, what's the sustainable uh, value of each. So, the future. Quickly s sum up wh where this has all got to and, and the impact it's had. Obviously, it's had a huge impact on, on people using the site. We've now 
since the introduction of the project groups, which was again a, a really key thing and part of the school fellowship, was to introduce these project groups, we've um, managed to encourage a global um, participation. So, for instance, this Drawing Out conference, which was a, a conference uh, between two universities, Australia and the UAL, has resources from all over the world. Now, they're depositing it. The people that are, are contributing are putting the resources on themselves. So, in a way, this is almost... And I'm getting these great emails from people saying, you know, how do you do this? And it's great, because this is them... Their, their first steps may be into open educational practice, rather than giving it to someone else to deposit, a, re, uh, a repository manager to deposit. So I think it's important that they get and uh, that they're actually involved in the process. Um, okay, so the, the big thing is that Process Arts, as since obviously it's it's uh, been going and it's obviously had a huge impact over the last year. The university has now said we'll take it as a service. So they've acknowledged that Process Arts exists. They're basically going to embed it into the VLE as a, a sort of one leg in, one leg out sort of service. So it's going to be a, a sort of in-house service for all staff and students to use, but uh, anyone from outside in the world can come in as well. Uh, so what we're trying to do is obviously bring industry into that, bring alumni into that, bring all the institutions into that, uh, all other institutions into that. So it's it's, it's almost turn. And the great thing about that is that now it's got a sustainable future. It's got money for development, so we can do all the things that we wanted to do. Um, the questions to be asked are what's going to, how's it going to change? Obviously, we're not going to be able to do the agile, uh, seat of your pants sort of stuff, but we're going to be able to. Um, have a more um, considered development strategy, which I think is really good. But I think that for me, it's great because when I've got 500 logged in users and uh, nearly 300, 250 people, unique visitors a day, it's, if it goes down, it's all on my neck at the moment. So I'm happy to, to have a little bit of a shared responsibility there. Um, so that, that's the big way, the, the big thing for the future, and that's what I'm hopefully going to be doing this month, um, and tying that into the score as well to just wrap up the final report. Uh, the other thing that I've been involved in is an open educational practice unit that we're developing at the University of Arts London, and again, um, is, a, is a big part of the development of it, which is really great because that's basically what the next stage for this. Really, now we've got our environment, we can start really concentrating on embedding practice. So, I think at that point I can stop. Thank you. We're very tight for time again, so I'm going to ration it to one contribution. First, I'm really interested. I'm just I'm kind of interested in how you got the, the groups thing off the ground because the, the problem with a lot of this kind of web two stuff is you need a sort of critical mass of people. Otherwise, it just bumps along at a very low level. And the project I've been working on is actually trying to reverse attempts to try to get, which is part of the rationale, is a community of practice. There's been various attempts to try to get some alternative groups off the ground. And you get a couple of people enthusiastic to begin with, and if you don't get enough people to respond, it quickly fades away. So, how do you get that? Exactly. And, and, um I think basically here, if you see, if you see the groups we have, uh, we've already just started a Drupal community of practice at, at University of London and Grand, which is great. Um, it's about meeting needs, and if you look at Fashion Colloquia, which is again, it's um, it's um, a London University, uh, London College of Fashion, uh, University in Paris, Milan, New York, they're all going to be contributing to this onto the resources. So it's again, they, they need a place to put resources. So and uh, so the conference side, um, um, but I guess it's also about embedding into projects. So a lot of the digital literacies, uh, mini projects that we're doing, they they had basically this answered their problem. They wanted somewhere to deposit or to come together to uh, build a community. Um, they didn't really want to go on Facebook. It's not for them. Where do they go? 
this is a, a ready-made space for them to walk into. I'll give you the, the one scenario, the Fashion Colloquia, which was the very first group that came. I, I met with the organiser of that, and he wanted to build a repository. He was looking at thousands and thousands of pounds to, to get this going. I said, well, let's just make a group on Process Arts. We did it. Uh, student developer spent a week on it. It's 200 and whatever quid. And th th they were up and running, and they managed to put 50 resources on the way. So, you know, it, it met a need. It was a sustainable um, for them. And, and it, that's, that's basically where it's going in regards to uh, the groups, really. It's about meeting interests. So it can be an individual. So, for instance, like this metalwork group is it's a metalwork group open to everyone, but the main person leading it at the moment is, is a tutor that's putting all these resources on. And he moved actually from blogs because he wasn't satisfied on blogs. He wasn't getting the, uh, what he wanted from blogs in regards to the participation and the crossover of, of content. And I think that's, the again, the importance of metadata and you know, having this tag cloud here and all that sort of stuff. It crosses over with metalwork and theatre and all the other departments. Can you explain that vintage history of going through the program? Yeah, yeah, digital stewarding, yeah. 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 And, and, and that's basically what you need for each group. You need, you need a digital steward, but you want to have as many digital stewards as possible, I think. And, um, and like... Um, the the metalwork tutor the reason he, he wanted to come onto here was to get into the and this is one of the key challenges again and one of the other challenges is is communication and uh, getting people to um, talk to each other and uh, maybe review content and all that sort of stuff and that's what we're embedding into the open educational practice unit is uh, a, an element of that of peer uh, review of the OER that they produce and I think this is great. Um, sorry, going to move on. That was amazing. Your, your process arts related case. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.